The title of my message, Surviving as Lambs in Wolf Country. Surviving as Lambs in Wolf Country. Every time February approaches African American History Month, I cannot help but begin to think of a figure in African American history that we do not often talk about, but he was a 14-year-old boy who probably did as much to launch the civil rights movement as Rosa Parks. In fact, this 14-year-old boy, Rosa Parks said she was thinking about him when she sat down on the bus and refused to give up her seat. She said she was thinking about this 14-year-old boy. His name was Emmett Till. And on August the 28th, 1955, this 14-year-old boy, visiting relatives in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, from Chicago, did not fully appreciate the, the societal mores of Mississippi. And he allegedly was flirting, 14-year-old boy, with the 24-year-old white proprietor of a little country store. Well, you know the horrible consequences of this action. He was bludgeoned to death, shot, and then drowned. I mean, it was, it was horrific. And his mother, Mamie, refused to have a closed casket. And Jet Magazine and a few of the other black magazines showed the horrific consequences of racism around the nation and, and rallied the African-American community to the extent that Rosa Parks said, when I was sitting there, I was thinking about Emmett Till. It was almost as if uh, the cup was running over. Enough is enough. When our children are no longer safe, enough is enough. The two men who killed him, who later confessed, a man whose last name was Bryant and his half-brother whose last name was Milan, they, they told the story to Look Magazine. And because of double jeopardy, they couldn't be uh, retried for the case that they had been acquitted of a few years ago. And as they told it, there was pain in my heart as I read it, and there was joy. For one thing, they said as they were beating him, he, he kept crying for mama, and he kept saying, Lord, have mercy. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, nobody can cry, Lord, have mercy. I don't care what you're going through. And not like the thief on the cross eventually find paradise. So God moves in mysterious ways. But the thing that he me most profoundly as they told the story of how they went to that house in the middle of the night and got this young man was even as they took him out, he was oblivious to how grave his situation was. He was a lamb in wolf country. And, and one writer actually called him in terms of the civil rights movement. Uh, uh, Cleona Weems called him a sacrificial lamb for the movement, a lamb in wolf country. Now you are about to launch your outreach center. And our Bible passage today deals with Jesus launching his outreach ministry. So it is most apropos. Jesus sent out 72 people, and it seemed kind of inefficient when I first read it because I would have sent them out one by one, but he sent them out two by two. You see, you need backup. You need somebody to encourage you. Uh, you do some stuff when there are two of you that you'd never do if you were just all by yourself. I was working with Dr. Rock in an evangelistic meeting when I was a student at Oakwood University. It was in Memphis, Tennessee, and 
and Ben Ben Jones uh, was uh, my 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 partner as we went about and and it was time to collect the baptismal bundles and we drove all the way out to a lady we had been seeing 50 miles to get her baptismal bundle and there was her husband there we had never met him and he said she's changed her mind now he was a big guy normally he changed her mind her, she changed her mind i said well fine that's that that's good but you see i'm from the hood okay, see you drive 50 miles and you from the hood, I don't care how big you are talking about she's changed her mind. I said, what did you just tell me? He said, I'm speaking for my wife. My wife has changed her mind. Now, I know it must have astounded Benny because I said, look, I don't care whether she gets baptized or not. I'm not leaving here without some clothes. You hear me? I drove, to, I said, if I have to go in and get the bundle myself. And Benny was just looking like, I said, I'm going to do it. He backed off. She said, I'll get a bundle. I'll get a bundle. Well, the interesting thing is, about 15 years later, I was preaching in Memphis. And somebody came up and kissed me at the door at the end. She said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, ma'am, I sure don't. She said, if it wasn't for you going crazy on me, 15 years ago, I would not be a member of God's Sabbath-keeping church. You see, when you got backup, when you got somebody to encourage you, you will do some interesting things. And he gave them as he gives you. He gave them power before they left. Hallelujah. He says in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Uh, nothing will harm you. And I want you to know as you launch your outreach center, no devil in hell can stop you. I've stopped by to tell you Isaiah 54, 17 is still true. No weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. It does not say that the weapon will not be formed. It does not say that the weapon will not come against you. But by the power of the risen Christ, the devil is a defeated foe. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. He sent them out two by two, and he gave them instructions for survival as lambs in a wolf's world. Check it out in, in Luke 10, beginning with verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest Therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, you all are about to go to two services, so you ought to have enough workers to go into the harvest field. Verse 3, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. I'm sending you out into wolf country. Now, God has blessed you. <laughs> To get your old church and this church. Lord have mercy. You're talking about a God who, who's got a sense of humor. Move you out of one and then say no. I tell you what, because God always, I've discovered, throws in a bag of chips. You know, all that and a bag of chips. I'll give you the bag of chips as well. But, he, but, but, but he, he told me to tell you that with all of your blessings, don't forget that you are in wolf country. Or there are going to be folk that will come against you. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are lambs in wolf country. And you can survive as a lamb in wolf country. How do you do it? The first thing you must do is release the power of prayer. The harvest is plentiful, says verse 2, but the workers are few. 
pray that the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus said, it doesn't matter that I've given you power to cast out demons. It doesn't matter that I've given you power to heal the sick. There is still power in prayer. And you've got your outreach center, but never let go of the weapon of prayer. You can do some things with prayer that you can't do with money. You can do some things with prayer that you can't do with relationship. You can do some things with prayer that you can't do with networking. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will move on you. And move on those around you. And never underestimate the power of prayer. Jesus said, before you go, you better release the power of prayer. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, was very successful there preaching in England. But throughout his service, Dr. Bird, he had a prayer team praying throughout the worship service. And he attributed the success of his ministry not to his eloquence, not to his erudition, but to the power of prayer. Now, some of us are scared, scared of prayer, don't quite know what to do with it. My wife and I were talking about it today, and Brenda was telling me how God is helping her to discover the power of fervent prayer. Okay, You know, I, I got a woman of God that I sleep with on a regular basis, doctor. The girlfriend was talking to me. Here she is talking to the preacher this morning. God has taught me, honey, about the power of fervent prayer. You see, intensity matters when it comes to prayer. James 5.16 says the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous. You praying those patty cake, patty cake, baker man prayers. Wonder why God's not moving in your behalf. Oh, if you're going to launch an outreach center, we need somebody like Hannah who knows how to pray like she's inebriated. Lips moving, but no words coming out. People so upset that the preacher is saying, girl, have you been drinking? Hallelujah. Elijah was so upset when people were giving Baal credit for what Jehovah God was doing. They were saying Baal is the one who sends the rain. Baal is the one who causes the grass to grow. And Elijah in the lonely country of Tishbe said, Lord Jehovah, stand up on your throne and, and stretch yourself. Let these people know that you are the one who has the power. And James 5.17 says that one, I'm not talking about 50 men praying. I'm not talking about 150. I'm not talking about you didn't even need two services it was just one man one man stopped the rain for three and a half years and when he went to Ahab the king of, of Israel he said I've stopped in here to tell you thus saith the Lord God of Israel there will ne be neither dew nor rain until I say so Lord Jesus you know that's a bad brother when you go to the king and say, nothing's coming out of the sky, not, and nothing's coming out of the ground. See, with, 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 with my limited faith, I'd have just prayed, stop the rain. He said, we don't even want any dew up here either. And so as you open your outreach center, you better do what Jesus had his disciples do as they launched their outreach. Release the power of prayer as Obi-Wan uh, Kenobi told Luke Skywalker use the force Luke use the force power in prayer instruction number two instruction number two expect trials and difficulties Jesus didn't sugarcoat it Verse 3, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Everybody smiling in your face is not working for you. You got people trying to set you up, pastor. Got people laying traps for you. You know, and, and, and you better stop walking around like you in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. You're in wolf country. It's a beautiful day for the rain. A beautiful. We're opening up. We're opening up the outreach center. We're opening. You better wake up. 
You remember Joseph? Oh, pretty boy Joseph. See, Joseph's mama was Rachel. And the Bible says in Genesis 29, Rachel was beautiful of face and form. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Rachel was a combination Angela Bassett, Halle Berry, and Beyonce rolled up <laughs> into one. Lord Jesus. Uh, that, 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 that's what the Hebrew says, Pastor. You got to, you got to know these biblical languages here. Yeah. Rolled up into one. And the Bible says she was so fine that Jacob started crying when he met her. And that's a pretty woman. I've met many attractive women. Not a single one has made me cry when she passes oh, I'm so happy to meet you. Okay. Hold on. Now, there are many who will make you cry after you meet them. <laughs> Lord Jesus. You remember the story? She had an older sister, Leah. Bible says Leah was tender-eyed. You can study all the commentary. No matter uh, 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 which commentary you read, it's bad news. It's bad news. Some say she had an ocular secretion. Others say she was cross-eyed. You say, why are you looking at me? I'm not looking at you. You know, one of those deals. So there you had this man married to two women, Halle and Shanae. Okay? Lord Jesus. And every nine months, Shanae is cranking out a new, a new child looking just like her. And old fine Rachel can't have any babies. She goes to Jacob up there talking about, give me children or I'll die. And Jacob says, woman, am I a god? Leah, just, I'm pregnant again. And finally, Rachel had... Denzel, oh, Lord have mercy. Pretty boy Joseph. And daddy, they're finding all over and putting Armani coat of many colors on him. And so he had pretty boy promenading around with Leah's children. And then I'm about, I had a dream, guy. You know, pretty boy talking about dreaming. You see, love can see from afar. Luke chapter 15, speaking of the, of, the, of the father of the prodigal son, said, and when the boy was a great distance off, he saw, love can see from afar, but so can hate. Genesis 37, 19 and 20 said, and they saw him from afar. Pretty boy. Walking there, the coat of many colors brushing the dew from the lips of the tulip. He walking, and they said to themselves, Behold, the dreamer comes. Come now, let us kill him. This, this is blood talking. Come now, let us kill him and cast him into a pit. And we will see what will become of his dreams. And Joseph, oblivious because he didn't expect trouble. Hi, guys. Daddy sent me. As you launch your program, Pastor, you better have your God up out there. It's a rough word. You're in wolf country, ladies and gentlemen. John 3, verse 19. Our blessed Lord said in John 3, verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people prefer darkness to light. John 3, 19. You better remember, as you have your outreach, everybody's not going to welcome the light. People prefer darkness. And if you're going to survive as a lamb in wolf country, you need what I call the Arnold mindset. Remember Arnold and Willis in the television program, Different Strokes. And Willis was always trying to get Arnold into some trouble, but before Willis, there were Arnold. What you talking about, Willis? Expect trouble. Principle number three or instruction number three, if you're going to survive... If you're going to survive in, in lamb, uh, as a lamb in wolf country, you need to travel light. You need to travel light. Lighten up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 3, go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Verse 4, do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Lighten up. 
we, we need to learn how to let go of some stuff. We got all these, you know, pack rats clinging to stuff. And some of you are so old, you ought to be giving it all to the church because you don't have long to stay here anyhow. Let it go. Uh, I, I, I've learned that fancy education does not necessarily make people super intelligent. I have a son who's graduating from the University of Chicago soon, and I can't help wait for that to happen. And he's always reminding me, Dad, you don't have long to stay here. I said, what you talking about? And it's going to be all hours eventually. In there. They're already planning for the empire, to take over the empire. I said, son, even if you thought that, your school should have given you enough sense not to say it. <laughs> Travel, but he's got a point. Learn how to lighten up. Luke chapter 12 says, verse 15, your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess. You can't take it with you. I hate to tell some of you that. You can't take it with you. Oh, and I was a chaplain on a ship, and I came in one day when the stock market had crashed. It was Black Thursday, they called it, and all of the captains and commanders in the wardroom were all upset, and I was just there smiling as a chaplain. Didn't you hear? I said, yes, the stock market crashed. They said, well, why are you smiling? I said, I don't have anything in the stock market. They said, what are you talking about? You don't have anything. What do you do with your investments? I said, I learned that I couldn't take it with me, but I did learn that I could send it ahead. I've got a stock market that I invest in. I don't lay up for myself treasures on earth. I've got a stock market that will never crash. Lighten up. Wembley Phipps dropped by the Capitol. He was in town to sing, and he came in, and we started talking. He had this little suitcase. You know, when you travel in Europe, you can tell American tourists just by looking at the suitcase. Europeans have very small suitcases. So here's Wendley with this little suitcase. So we were about to go to lunch. I said, where's the rest of your luggage? He said, this is it. I said, you're here for a concert, and this is all? I said, Wendley, you know good and well I said, I travel all the time. There is no way in the world that you can. I said, where's your second suit? He said, I I'm wearing it. <laughs> I said, you only travel with one suit? He said, yeah. And then, if you know Wendley, he opened it up and showed me how he can travel. He said, around the world with one. He said, I don't check any luggage. I just have this one little carry-on. And most of it, you know, the DVDs and the tapes that he sings with. I said, Lord, have mercy. We got to learn how to lighten up. Some of us, when we go on a trip, you think we're moving permanently to the destination that we're going to. Instruction, instruction number four is, instruction number four is concentrate on your task. Philippians 3.13 says, Philippians 3.13 says, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Paul knew how to concentrate on the task. Jesus put it this way to his disciples, and do not greet anyone on the road. See, I'm sending you out on this outreach mission, verse 4. Don't take a purse, don't take a bag, don't take sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. The Jews had this custom of lengthy greetings. Jesus said, you are on the master's business of outreach. I'm going to be coming behind you, following you. I want to go to 35 cities. You don't have time for long salutations and greetings. Concentrate on the task. Ladies and gentlemen, it is amazing what you can accomplish when you have the this one thing I do attitude. Nehemiah did an amazing thing. He rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, which people had been trying to do for over a century, and Nehemiah did it in 52 days. What task in outreach do you want to accomplish with that beautiful new center that 
with focus, you will accomplish. Without focus, you're not going to accomplish. Greet no one along the road if you're going to survive as a lamb in wolf country. Nehemiah started working on the, on the walls, and someone said, why don't you come down and, and, and fellowship with us? Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3, Nehemiah sent back the word, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I come down to be with you? you got to learn how to concentrate on the task. There is nothing, Berean, that you can accomplish if you focus on the task. Instruction number five. Instruction number five. Take care of people's physical needs. When you launch outreach, Jesus said, don't just go in there with amazing facts tracks. We're here, the Atlanta Berean Outreach. Here is the amazing, don't be fooled. Here is the, Jesus said, the spiritual thing, that's good. But he said, that you got some hungry folk out there that need your outreach. You've got some folk fresh out of prison who need your outreach. And Jesus said, you ought to when you go. He said, heal the sick, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there. In other words, touch hurting lives and make a difference in people's physical lives. We sometimes act like everybody in the church is doing fine. And I grew up, I grew up eating that welfare cheese, welfare cornmeal, best grilled cheese sandwiches you'll ever have, some good cheese, best mac and cheese. But sometimes before the month would end and the welfare check was due, we would run out of food and my mother would come in and announce to the children, children, we're fasting today. <laughs> Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Now, Berean, voluntary fasting is good for the soul. It'll draw you close to the Lord. But I'm telling you, involuntary fasting will make you angry. We, we, we would go to church with an attitude, and my mama, who, my mama, if spanking had been an Olympic event, my mother would have been a multiple gold medal winner. I mean, girlfriend had hand-eye coordination like you did not believe. You would be arguing back at her. Her hands were so fat, you knew you were hit. You did, you did, you know, you, you knew, because your face was stinging. But you did not see the blow, and neither did your siblings. Oh, you man down, man down. <laughs> so there were five of us, and my mother would line us up, and she would say, now when you go to church, you better not let anyone know that you have not eaten anything, and you better not let anyone know that you, you are hungry. And she would be behind us like a shepherd with sheep, and we would stare step children, and the five of us would walk into Berea Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church trying to signal with our eyes that we were hostages. <laughs> I'm talking about taking care of people's physical needs. Here I am, just hungry, hadn't eaten anything. People up to my happy Sabbath. <laughs> I'll give you a happy hour. You want us a happy nothing, you know. The Lord is good. And wondering why I didn't come back with all the time. I'll give you a Lord is good. But to the credit of the Berea Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church, that's why I'm still a member of Berea. Will always be a member of Berea, okay? Credit of the Berea Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church Doc Bird, not a Sabbath went by where somebody did not say, Pearlene, you're going home with us today. You're going to eat with us. Okay? You know? and, and many of them didn't know how much they were blessing. And these were people who were serious because my mother, we thought she was out of her mind. My mother would say, oh, we're just fine. We said, is she crazy? <laughs> is she crazy? And, no, no. and, 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 and these are the, don't, you ignore the wizard. They say, Pearlene, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, you're going home and eating with me today. Okay. Now, that, that, that came time for the back room. My mother would put us in the back room, five of us, and she said, now look, we're going over Sister Ada Thornton's house today. Now, I'm telling you, 
If she says to you, and I want you to answer right now, because you know what will happen to you if you, if Sister Ada Thornton comes in to the uh, dining room and says, have you had enough? What is your response? And are we looking at one another? Well, uh, we say, yes, ma'am, we have had enough. Okay. That's right. Okay. Now, she said, nope, not through with you yet. Now, we're going... Now, what if it's, it is not enough, but she says to you, can I get you something else? Uh, no, ma'am, you can't get you something else. Now, I could do that with Sister Thornton, but let me tell you, Sister Claire Lewis was off the chain in her cooking. Mac and cheese... When the aroma hits you, when you walk through the door, your knees buckle. I mean, talk about <laughs> veggie burger, loaf, sheep, and I, you know, and we would, I, I would just be like a drunk man when I go in there, particularly when I had anything. And Lord have mercy, we there just eating, my mama looking at us like a, the Gestapo officer, you know. <laughs> and then came the moment of truth. Sister Lewis up there talking about, can I get you something else? And all my siblings said, no, ma'am. But I was thinking. And finally I said, I want some more, please. I want some more. My mother started laughing so hard, tears started rolling down her face. I said, I'm willing to take the pain for the game. <laughs> As you launch your outreach center, I challenge you to remember Jesus said, heal somebody. In the parable of the judgment in Matthew chapter 25, the judge of the universe does not ask anything about your theological orthodoxy. He does not say, do you understand the 2300-day prophecy? He does not say, do you understand the spirit of prophecy? He does not say, did you get to Sabbath school on time? He does not say, have you, have you eaten enough veggie burger loaf? He says, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was in prison, did you visit me? I was sick, did you minister to me? I was a stranger, did you take me in? Don't you have people sleeping on the steps of your outreach center in the cold? I was a stranger. Did you take me in? And that is a five-pronged strategic plan for any outreach. And that is the accountability that you will have to the sovereign God of the universe. Instruction number six, don't let rejection stop you. Mm -mm -mm, Lord Jesus, don't let rejection stop you. Verse 8 of Luke 10, when you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come to you. Verse 10, but when you enter a town and are not welcome, and in wolf country you will not always be welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. Your outreach is not to make sure that you are accepted and that people will celebrate you. You are to do your work in the name of Jesus Christ. You are to do it for him and not for anybody else. And don't let rejection stop you because Jesus didn't even win everybody. In Mark chapter 6 in his hometown, the Bible says he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Here is the omnipotent incarnate Christ and he's laying hands on people and nothing is happening because of their unbelief. A rich young ruler in Luke 18 went away sorrowfully because the demand was too high. In Luke chapter 9, James and John went to a Samaritan village on some outreach. Remember, Jesus sent out the 12 in Luke 9 before he sent out the, the 72 in Luke 10. And in verse 52 through 56, the Samaritan village rejected. <laughs> they rejected James and John. And James and John, knowing the power that Jesus had, said, look, Lord, you know, I'll tell you what I'd do. If I, you know, I'm just making a recommendation here. 
But you remember how Elijah called down fire out of heaven? He said, why don't you call down some fire and nuke this town? They've rejected you. And Jesus says, you do not know what spirit you are speaking of. One of the greatest discoveries of my life has been don't let rejection slow you down. I learned it from call porter work. But when you're knocking on doors, people are hiding and looking, you know, the, bum, 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 bum. you know they're in there. You, know. you hear them scurrying around after the knock. You know. and, and, and nobody, and sometimes they say, nobody's home, you know. <laughs> and I'm just knocking, knocking, knocking. This is trembling. And, you know, and then when they open it, you know, don't, 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 I'm trying to sell some books to go to Oakwood College. Blah, blah, blah. We don't want any. Boom. And I'm you're just standing there. Thank you very much. So finally, this was, in, this was in Alabama. I knew that African Americans didn't have much money, so I did, this is in the 60s, in the segregated South, I did what no sane individual should do. I had an African roommate, and I noticed when we would go downtown, people would treat him differently, because he was from Africa. They would treat me like a stepchild, but they treated him different. I said, I'm going into wolf country to do call porter work. So I didn't know what I was going to do, but I tiptoed in there, knocked on the door, big 6263, and what do you want? I said, my name is Ilhaji Haruna. I am from Nigeria. I try to sell the books in order to go to school. Well, come on in, Ilhaji. You from Africa? I started selling every house. Yeah, I called some of my friends, a little African boy out here selling that. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your pleasure. <laughs> Led the Southern Union in call porter work. Didn't tell anybody how I did it and asked the Lord to forgive me for my subterfuge. <laughs> you got to survive as a lamb in wolf country. So my sisters and my brothers, if you're going to survive, as a lamb in wolf country, you've got to learn how to release the power of prayer. You've got to learn how to expect trouble. If you're going to survive as a lamb in wolf country, you've got to travel light and concentrate on your task. If you're going to survive as a lamb in wolf country, you must not become discouraged when the problems come, but take care of physical needs. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the incarcerated, minister to the sick. You will be successful, but even if you're rejected, remember there was someone who was despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not you see i know what it feels like to be a lamb in wolf country i walked in at 10 years old and my daddy was pointing a loaded gun at my mother i know what it is to be a lamb in wolf country I came home three times and our furniture was out on the street. I know what it is to be a lamb in wolf country. When I had a command chaplain, my first command chaplain and I had a verbal altercation and the N-word slipped out and I knew I was in wolf country. I know what it is to be a lamb in wolf country, but I've also learned that if I trust Jesus, if I follow where he leads, it's going to be all right for we are our heavenly father's children and we all know that he loves us one and all just ask for strength and keep right on striving although the tears may fall we have the joy of his assurance our heavenly father he will always answer prayer for we know i don't know about you but i know i'm so glad i know jesus will never lay on me more than i can bear he's already waited he already knows how much i can take and as i move into wolf country he's there up 
pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He's there to lead me all the way. I'm gonna follow, come what may, a lamb in wolf country. That's all right. I'm gonna follow Jesus. I will follow be my savior. Wheresoever my lot may be, where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I'll follow thee. I'm going to follow through the storm, follow through the rain, follow through wolf country. And one day soon and very soon, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ are going to get up. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. I said caught up, caught up, caught up to meet him in the air. And when I get to heaven, can I say one more thing, Doc? Just as soon as my feet strike Zion, I'm going to lay down my heavy burdens. I'm going to put on my robe in glory. I'm going to shout and tell my story. I'm going to move on up a little higher. I'm going to talk with old man Daniel. I'm going to move on up a little higher. I'm going to speak with the Hebrew children, but I'm not going to stop until I see Jesus. I'm going to take my crown. I'm going to cast it at his seat. He's the one who brought me through wolf country. I'm going to say, worthy, worthy is the lamb. Worthy to receive power, honor, Riches, strength, forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah, 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 amen. So launch your outreach. It's going to be a beautiful thing at five. But know as you begin this significant outreach that you are being sent forth as lambs in the midst of wolves. So release the power of prayer. It'll knock down obstacles that you wouldn't believe. It can stop the rain. Expect trouble. Don't be naive. This is not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. This is a sinful world. Travel light. Concentrate on your tasks. Take care of people's physical needs. And don't let rejection stop you. I want to make an appeal today to three groups of people. I want to appeal to someone who has never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life. You've never prayed the sinner's prayer. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your lips and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. You've never asked Jesus to sit on the throne of your life. I appeal to you to make that decision today. Second group I want to appeal to, I want to appeal to backsliders. Wolf country has brought you to the pig pen. You've done, a, you've done things that have brought outward reproach upon the name of Christ. You need to be restored. You need to come back home. You need to be rebaptized. I appeal to you to make that decision today. Third group I want to appeal to is some man or woman who may already be a Christian. 
But the light of God's Sabbath truth has come to you and you want to walk in that light. You need to make that decision today as well. So if you are in any of those groups naming Jesus as Lord for the first time, a backslider who needs to be restored, a Christian who wants to walk in the additional light of God's Sabbath. I want you to stand on your feet right now where you are, man, woman, boy, girl. Just stand up for Jesus where you are right now. Well, you just stand where you are. You know you're in those groups. God bless you. Just stand where you are. Stand up. God bless you. Just stand where you are. Praise God. He's calling you. God bless you. Praise God. Tell you what, why don't you, if you're in one of those groups, why don't you just come forward? Give me your hand right now. Just come, come forward quickly. I want to have a special prayer with you. Just slip out and come right down this aisle quickly. Man, woman, boy, girl, just save your Savior. Hallelujah. Come, come. You're standing. You know you need to be here. Come, quickly. Come quickly. Praise God. Just, where are you? Where are you? Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You know you're in one of those groups. You need to come to Jesus right now. God bless you. God bless you. Come quickly. We're going to have a special prayer for your anointing. Let me at thy throne of mercy find the sweet release. Hallelujah. I'm feeling God's spirit in this place calling you right now. Today if you hear his voice, hard not your heart. Where are you? Hallelujah. <laughs> Kneeling there in deep contrition. God bless you. Hallelujah. Help my unbelief. Where are you? He's calling you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm, I'm calling you, Savior. I'm calling you, Savior. God bless you, dear. Why don't you? My humble cry, hey, and why, while on others, while on others, must be somebody from this side, must be somebody from this side, feeling the presence of the Holy Ghost. Today is your day, today is your day. By the spring of all my comfort. More than life. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh. Who have I on earth beside me? heaven but me. Where are you? He's calling you. He's calling you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm calling you. Hear my cry. Calling you. Why don't you My humble cry. Yeah. Why? Now, 
before the choir sings one more stanza in the refrain. Many years ago, as a young preacher in South Atlantic Conference, I had a service like this in Florence, South Carolina, my district, and made an appeal for people who hadn't made Jesus Lord of their lives or had backslidden to come forward. Last person to walk down the aisle was a 23-year-old bodybuilder, a handsome young man. We had a potluck afterwards and he told me, Preacher, I have a lot of baggage in my life. I said not to come, but something said to me, this may be your last chance. I've never forgotten that experience because the following Tuesday he was murdered. I officiated at his funeral. It was not a sad funeral. It was a glad funeral because Although he hadn't had the opportunity to get baptized, the devil tried to take him out. Double barrel shotgun. The devil may have taken him out in the temporal sphere with a double barrel shotgun, but I'm going to chat with that young man at a welcome table in a land beyond sun, moon, and stars because he made the decision. And every time I appeal, I think about that young man. And I don't want to end without letting someone like that make his or her calling an election sure. So as the choir sings softly, you know who you are. Holy Ghost has already told me you're out there. You need to get up, come down here, join these beautiful people who have come and make salvation fixed and settled today. You're a lamb in wolf country. You need backup from the great shepherd. His name is Jesus. Won't you come quickly as we end this appeal? Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's right, devil. You can't have him. This is God's child. You can't have this young man. Praise God. Savior, Savior. Whoa. Come on. Come on. Calling you Savior. Did it once for the Father, once for the Son. Let's do it a final time for the Holy Ghost. I think there's at least one more person. I'm feeling it in my spirit. Savior, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The door of the ark is about to close. Where are you? Where are you? Hear my, hear my humble cry. silence of this moment, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to end this appeal like they do at Cape Kennedy. I'm going to count backwards from 10 to 0 and at the and that this appeal is over. Come on, come on, come on. Here, there she is. I knew somebody else was here. Praise God. Come on, come on. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you, dear. Counting backwards from 10 to 0, and then the appeal is over. Don't let this opportunity to pass. The Bible says today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, zero.
zero. Let's give God a hand praise. Hallelujah. Heads are bowed. I'm going to ask each of you who has come forward to join hands with someone. I need a point of connection here as well. Praise God. Yes, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, on this outreach Sabbath, you are sending us forth as lambs in the midst of wolves. And this beautiful battalion of people who responded yes to your call. This beautiful battalion has come forward and we praise your name. And now as we join hands, we are touching and agreeing. I am asking you, Lord, for a special anointing of your Holy Spirit on each person who has come forward tonight. Uh, this evening, I, I, this afternoon. I'm also asking, Lord, for special healing. Whatever the physical malady, whatever the physical challenge, I want you to bless their courage to come forward today with the anointing of your Holy Ghost and special healing. Now, you said in James 4, verse 2, we have not because we ask not so we're asking you for it but you also said in Luke eleven thirteen, that if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children how much more are you eager to give your Holy Spirit to those who ask and so we're asking for a special anointing today thank you Lord <laughs> thank you thank you for hearing and answering this prayer because we pray this prayer in the name that is above every name. We pray this prayer in the matchless name of Jesus. And for his sake, amen and amen. Put your hands together. Give God praise and glory in the house. Is he all right? Is he all right? Is Jesus all right? Yes, yes, yes.